story about um, uh, well, the whole story about the whole system. And I will tell the story about uh, the Norwegian summit. Uh, I've been talking today a lot about you know cuisine and um, and restaurants and that. Uh, and this is the story about how it inputs into the restaurant clearly um, the fish. So in, in Norway, um, the fishing industry, well, the fish farming industry related to, to, to the Norwegian summit started from a very entrepreneurial perspective. Uh, with entrepreneurs uh, along the coastline of Norway trying out, testing, you know, new things. How to actually, actually farm the summit. So, um, Norway is, most of you know, that little country up here with a very long coastline. We have been, of course, fishing and taking out resources from the sea um, forever. And the fishes always start with export industry after oil and gas, we are a resource-based um, country. And um, in 2015, export salmon was worth 6 million US dollars. So it's a very global product, uh, and it's, uh, I guess, globally known also in 150 countries, EU's largest export market. And uh, we see this as Norway's most important response to the challenge faced by the world, namely to produce efficient and healthy food for a rapidly growing population. And if you can see the charts here, uh, the dark blue ones here are agricultural production, and we can see that it's actually increasing in the world. And this is captured from wild cat. And also the last couple of weeks, there was um, many articles in San Francisco Chronicle about um, uh, the lack of the wild salmon actually uh, being caught uh, on the coast here. So uh, um, I see that fish farming has an important role in in producing enough food for the most of the world population. So going back to Norwegian agriculture, um, as I said, Norwegian seafood culture um, originated from the richness of marine resources going back centuries. And it has been a vital basis for vibrant local communities along the whole coastline of Norway. And if you stretch out the coastline of Norway, it actually goes two and a half times around the world. So it's like you have a very long coast, even though the country is, is very small. So, as I said, it also started from, from uh, the fishermen. You know, being out to sea and fishing the, the wild catch. They have the money from good years of, of herrings and, and cod along the coast. And they also had, of course, a lot of experience, and they also had some technology. So they started to test out if they actually could, um, could um, uh, farm fish. Because, of course, they would have a supply of fish that was more constant than uh, the wild fish. So they, they tried out and first trout in fresh, in fresh water, then they expanded to rainbow trout, and then it is into salmon also in salty water, and so on. So both the people, the money, and technology from the fishing fleets, from the more traditional fishing sector, was then put into, into fish farming. And, um, and most of it was based on experience-based knowledge, by trying and, and failing. And um, it's, um, it's also a story about all the different, what should I say, um, factors that actually goes into farming a fish. Of course, you have to have the right equipment, you have to feed it well, you have to weed it, and you have to find medicine for it, all the things that you know, can happen to it. And of course, you know, you need to process it. And in the initial phase, um, all of the input that was uh, fed into to these different factories came from very many different sources. First of all, it was um, Research carried out in the in research institutes. It was technology transfer from from other uh, countries, from Denmark, for example. It was also uh, through um, people that had taken research or taken education from abroad that had taken their competence, their scientific competence, to look for camera, for example, on Mars pieces, on how to to grow uh, grow salmon. And it was also uh, through systems that were there already from, from the old, old fisheries. So this is a story about you know, all these different components and all these different milieus that actually played a role into the whole system around producing salmon. And um, 
Along the way, a lot of innovations happened through this combination of actors and institutions and organizations. And one of the most important uh, activities that actually came, came along and that was forced by the government was that there were some diseases with the, with, the, with the fish that we couldn't have. So the government said, okay, we will give you a lot of money to conquer or to, to fight this disease, but that means that you need to collaborate. Uh, you that work in the, in the agricultural issues, and you guys that work in science with uh, the more agriculture-based um, uh, problems, you need to actually work with the entrepreneurs in this sector. And you all need to talk together. And if you do that, we will fund a research project that can conquer uh, the kind of fish or health issues that you're having. So this actually laid the ground for for this industry and for this, all these different actors that come together. And, and this means, of course, technology transfer between very different sectors and also kind of communications with the more experience based learning by doing entrepreneur. So we also then combine kind of scientific knowledge with the kind of entrepreneurial knowledge. And that meant, uh, of course, we had these different innovations along the line, but then, of course, also with all these innovations, they evolved and they were incremental and, and radical changes all along the way. And this made a kind of whole system all together. So all of this has now become very specialized knowledge and it's a lot of global suppliers within the health industry, within the feed, within the breeding that now you know, supplies input into the salmon farming industry. So um, in a way you have originally from the entrepreneur into this very high-tech scientific milieu on the outside that now are dealing and trying also to combine this different knowledge because all of this is actually linked together in a way. Because of course what you get in in the salmon, uh, what it tastes and, and what kind of your know, vitamins and whatever it's in the salmon, it comes from how you read it, what kind of medicine you put into it, and so on. And in the field. Uh, bringing something new into the market, like farmed fish, for example, and made also challenges at the political level or the ministry level. Who should be responsible for this thing, you know, the farmed fish? Is it agriculture, because we farm it? Is it fish? Is it linked to the process industry, because I can process it in order to, you know, to eat it? Or should the environmental ministry take control because it was, of course also has some environmental issues and all this. So we had a lot of discussions there and many ministries uh, wanted to play a role and of course that also has consequences for how an industry actually evolves. So around the system you have all these different actors, you have the policy and you have the government structure that all in a way needs to be combined and, and communicate in order to build an industry. And of course, these have, have been a lot of challenges uh, along the way, and the challenges are still there because, of course, there are new problems and new issues that needs to be dealt with. And uh, I mentioned just some of them here. Uh, you have to pull a diverse set of knowledge for more proactive development because you get new challenges and new knowledge. I mean, all the time in the system, you have to bring, uh, you have to build strong organizations with absorptive capacity to have to take in all the scientific knowledge and all the diversified knowledge actually needed. Um, and of course, this, this pressure for innovation along the way. So, uh, this was a very uh, quick go through of 40, 40 something years uh, in the fish farming industry in Norway, but it says something about complexity and all that needs to be in place in order to, you know, have, for example, a product like uh, salmon or uh, farmed salmon. Okay? Great. And we'll take questions at the end. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, hi, so we're going to shift gears a little bit, uh, okay. growing and harvesting ends, and then the eating. So uh, the first question we want to ask is why we want to eat wild food. Uh, so the first, I, I like to say um, delicious, nutritious, environmentally friendly. Um, I start with delicious because, you know, as Michael Bohm Frost aptly put out in the, the first session, if it isn't delicious, we're not going to get people on board. Um, I am a nutritionist, dietitian, um, as first and foremost, and I, I feel that I'm always trying to tell people, you know, we got to bring them in with delicious. Um, 
telling people, you know, we've seen this again and again, to eat their vegetables, not going to do it. You want people to be super excited about these ingredients. Uh, so this food is going to waste, and that is why we are trying to get uh, more people eating it. Um, this is a picture of a plant that we found growing in West Oakland. Can anyone tell me what this plant is? Mr. Show. Thank you. <laughs> Animated participant in the back. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Show. Uh, who has ever had any part of the Mr. Show plant before? Okay, a few of you. Who has ever had the leaves of the Mr. Show plant? Less of you. So, you can see even in this room, I would, I would love to do that with the entire audience to see who's tried the nasturtium leaves, um, that nasturtium flowers are often used as garnish, uh, but the leaves are really tasty, um, radish, like have the spiciness, um, very nutritious. We have some nutrition results back uh, that are really exciting. And um, largely just not being eaten or considered food. So, and we're in this group of food innovators, right? Um, and I actually just added this quote to my slides a few minutes ago, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, because I see this come up again and again in the presentations. Um, you know, from you know, Anthony is in here, they were the chef's table was talking about using the whole vegetable and how that's a really exciting... Um, it, we say that these things are new wild foods, using the whole vegetable, they're actually pretty old, right? We're just kind of coming back to that because of this necessity. Because we need to go back to these, these means of eating. And I think that that's getting people really excited about plants. So a lot of benefits, um, I can't really get into all of the benefits, but we have been investigating a few of these more specifically. Um, you can see, uh, kind of like Heidi was saying earlier, um, you can see that all these benefits don't relate to any one area of the food system. They um, kind of touch on a lot of different areas in the food system. Um, also, let's not forget survival skills, you know, drought, Armageddon's around the corner. Um, and largely these wild foods are free, right? They're growing and they're being wasted, and if we uh, take advantage of that, then they're free food. So one of the really exciting investigations that we have begun doing is looking at um, nutrition. <coughs> and as, as a nutritionist by trade, I kind of hate talking about nutrients, which sounds weird, but I like to think of the whole food and get people to eat more plants and have you know, a balanced diet and enjoy their food. But if you look at the nutrients, it's really exciting. Um, we're, we're comparing mallow. Has anyone ever had mallow in the room? It's grow it grows all over the place. Um, it's very kind of like a, a thicker petal, very soft, has kind of like unctuous qualities. So we're looking at one serving of mallow versus one serving of spinach. And you can see um, much higher potassium, five times as much fiber, uh, much more protein, calcium, iron than uh, spinach. So pretty cool, right? These wild foods have um, really great uh, nutrient content. And then if we look at dandelion, and this is comparing dandelion conventional to wild. So same plant, um, just one of them was found in you know, Platia, <laughs> sidewalk cracks in West Oakland, and the other one was purchased, or this was data from the USDA nutrient database. So, you know, it's conventionally grown. And you can see even just the same plant, um, these, these nutrient panels are a lot uh, better. Higher potassium, uh, twice as much fiber, calcium, iron. But I do want to mention with the mallow that there's more calcium in a half a cup of mallow than a half a cup of milk. So, if you have people telling you you need to be drinking um, dairy products with calcium or eating animal products, it's not true. You just go out and forage wallow. Um, so that's pretty exciting. That's one aspect of our research. Um, another aspect of our research is addressing some of the challenges. Uh, we find that one of the biggest challenges we face is overcoming the stigma about wild foods. So if you see this picture here, does anyone see this and think, yum? <laughs> Um, I know, I know one person in the room that does, but <laughs> but the, uh, can anyone tell me what this plant is here? Fennel. Yeah, that's right. So this is fennel. You can see tons of fennel growing here. This was also we did a lot of our uh, sample collecting west of Um in asphalt. And when we talk about urban foraging, I think people are, the first thing they think are like uh, you know kind of yuck. Well, they always talk about dog feet. Um, dog feet and 
Uh, environmental toxins. So people are really worried about environmental toxins. Uh, so that's a big area of our research as well, is um, investigating that. Because a lot of, there's not a lot of research out there about urban foraging and the potential uh, toxins. Uh, some other challenges here, I'm not going to get into all of them, but there are a lot, as um, if you're not surprised. And then, of course, the ideology, which we'll touch on in the next few slides. Would anyone, would anyone eat this, this fennel, if they, if they came across it? <laughs> a couple of you, a couple of you. What, if you. what if you found out that we had results showing that these plants um, had not concerning levels of environmental toxins? Would you be more likely to? Yeah, so our, our results, um, we're still analyzing some of the data, but um, we've taken about six, six samples. Six species. Six different species. Um, and we've gathered them from areas that look just like this. And so far, it's been really, really exciting. We kind of did it, and I was like, oh, we'll put in the room, what if the samples come back, and they're like really dangerous, but they're not. And we took them from really um, industrial areas. And you know, we're measuring common household pesticides, um, industrial pesticides. Uh, we're still waiting on the phthalates and uh, nutrition, PCBs. PCBs. Metals, we're, we're waiting on metals. heavy metals. Um, even if the soil was high in heavy metals, the plants do not. We're finding the plants don't bioaccumulate those metals. So no, these species. These species. Sorry. sorry. Under these soil yeah. conditions. Yeah. So obviously, you know, it's preliminary. We've only taken six different species, but it's promising. The, the, the metals are taken far more. But, okay. But, but for the, the nutrition and the pesticide residue. Yeah, but so far really exciting. None of them have been scary. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, okay, so so we all know that research is not everything. If we just measure these plants and say they're they're safe and they're really nutritious, that's not going to get people eating these plants, right? We everyone knows that we should be eating more fruits and vegetables, but America is still not doing it. So we need to do something else. And so we started a. Uh, Wild Food Week, we started it last year in April, and you know, during Earth Month. And we have restaurants, we get barrier restaurants to feature wild foods on their menus and highlight them and promote them all at the same time. And so in that way we can get people to start recognizing these plants as food. Um, and last year we had about five restaurants, um, including the, the perennial and a preview show, and this year we had um, about eight different restaurants, uh, Chez Panisse, The Perennial, Mission Heirloom, Sweet Green came on board, which is a national chain, so that was exciting. Brown's on campus. And I'll show some pictures from those as well. Um, so with the Wild Food Week, we're really tapping into the harvesting and distribution. And because um, not only are these wild plants growing in urban environments and being wasted, uh, largely, but in, on farms, there's a lot of weeds growing, right? And they're harvested. They're, they're fed, they're watered, they're harvested, they're composted. So we're, with Wild Food Week, we hope these, by these rest, getting these restaurants to start requesting these plants, farms, we'll start selling these plants, we're actually producing them, more money to the farm, and we'll start this, uh, we catalyze this distribution system uh, to expand beyond those restaurants. Does that make sense? And then also uh, on eating ends, uh, getting people to recognize these plants as foods, uh, maybe they'll start requesting them, they'll start seeing them in the wild and using them. And um, hopefully also increase the restaurant and farm revenue. Um, so uh, with Wild Food Week, one big, uh, kind of an interesting paradox with wild foods is on one end you have this sort of elitist foodie um, mindset and reputation about wild foods, right? A lot of like the fancier restaurants um, have wild foods on their menus and people have this concept of them. Um, but on the other hand, there's still this stigma that um, we don't want to eat wheat. So it's kind of trying to toe the line between these two things and uh, we, we completely recognize that a lot of these restaurants are not accessible to most of the population. Um, you know, we're not making, giving everyone access to wild foods by having Chez Panisse promote them on their menu. That's, that's not what's happening. But we're hoping that starting the conversation there, we'll start this distribution happening that maybe we can get them on a more, um, a larger scale, they'll start to be cheaper, people will recognize them as foods, and they'll really get out there more. Um, also this year we had uh, sweet green was on the menu, which you know, can be a higher price for lunches for many people, but it's not um, like a fine dining restaurant. 
and uh, Brown's Cafe, uh, I worked with Sam a lot on that. We had uh, wild greens on the menu, and we're going to do that in the future as well. So um, getting these larger scale places to use wild foods can start changing habits, hopefully. And this is a picture from Sweet Green, actually, of, if you've ever been there, they have like the, the shelves of, plant, of ingredients, and they had the one that said weeds on it, which was pretty exciting. Um, and we, we talked about earlier, you know, necessity is a mother of invention, and um, one of the benefits of wild foods is it can spark chef creativity. And you can see from these pictures, uh, this picture is a perennial, really beautiful um, presentation that they use a lot of cool ingredients, and then mission heirloom. So these are more of the, you know, dinner time, maybe a higher price point places, um, but then more of the lunchtime places, again, inspiring chef creativity. Um, and really what I, I try to do in my um, consulting and my work is get people excited about vegetables and um, plants, be it wild or otherwise, rather than uh, getting them to eat it because they think they have to. So these, looking at these makes you want to eat them because they're exciting. Um, so the future of Berkeley Open Source Food, um, we're just going to continue to try to tap into all of these different aspects of the food systems. Uh, food system to get people to eat more wild. Um, we need money <laughs> to do more research. These these testing this testing uh, requires a lot of money, um, but it's really it's really been awesome to see how excited people get about about wild foods. Um, even something simple as getting them to taste, uh, you know, bristly ox tongue, which is a plant that you find everywhere that no one knows about, and then they start seeing it under their feet, and they get really excited about it. And um, I think that's a really fun area to work in. And if you want to hear more about our research, um, forge.berkeley.edu, at osfood, uh, Twitter and Instagram handle. Um, I did have my uh, collaborator's names got left off, but you saw, you saw Philip already. And Tom Carlson's also a co-investigator with us. He's not here today. And then I, uh, my website is rootedfood.com. I do recipes with wild foods and using whole vegetable and plants. And I'd be happy to answer questions at the end, but um, I'm gonna sh we're going to shift gears to Matt, uh, who's going to talk about food waste more generally. Yeah. So I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum and sort of hopefully nobody wasted any food today. How many, how many of you are very good composters and very good separators of um, waste? I mean, we live in, most of us from the Bay Area, so it's sort of a great. Do you consider compost food waste or not? Well, you should be composting. I mean, so that gets into the bigger questions that kind of got me. Yeah, I mean, that's the, and that's the, so that's, I'm going to talk very more to this audience about food waste and how at least we get it in a compost bin, which is a better alternative than putting it in land, definitely from a climate perspective. But more broadly, my interest in this sort of this, this, this area is sort of looking at, the, there's a lot of interest, partially I think it's a little bit about politics. You can't talk about climate change in the U.S., but you can talk about the systems that are going to be affected by climate change. So whether it be food systems, water systems, or energy systems. So all of us in California know there's a tremendous amount of energy put into moving water. Water is a very scarce resource, or was, or it still is, it'll all be for, and, and we grow a lot of food. So how all those things collide are very, very important open questions. And so there's very interesting questions, which I'm not necessarily going to talk about today. How do you reuse food waste, make it into cool products, or thinking about how you compost it and take it back into energy. And we should at least be doing that with it. So I'm, going to, so I'm going to focus on food waste. Um, <coughs> propaganda from somebody, 55% of um, leftovers from restaurants end up here. First, I want to thank one of my master's students who was busy this year. This is this year, Leo. This is very much Leo's work. He actually flew back to Germany today. I think you probably met Leo. Leo, there's a, a whole group of people that are really passionate about food waste on campus, and we're doing a lot, beginning to do a lot of cool stuff. I don't think we're all necessarily talking to each other, not because we're avoiding each other, we just don't know about each other. And food waste is one of these really data poor things. I mean, it's, we know it's there, we know there's a lot of it, but people really don't know the intricacies of the data because to, to then be able to sort of change behavior. And so I'll show some results, but they're more composited in some ways. So why should we care about food waste? Well, this is some statistics from around 2012, 2013. We throw away about $180 billion a year in food. So food just goes, whether we buy it and don't eat it, goes out of the refrigerator, we buy too much, we go to a restaurant and don't eat it. If we look what happens to that food, 
environmentally. We're just wasting water, growing food we never eat. Um, uses two percent of our national energy, four percent of all greenhouse gas emissions. So this gets into Phil's comment about land composting versus landfills. I mean, a big issue with landfills in the U.S. is whether you vent the methane or not, because methane is a much bigger con contributor to greenhouse global warming than is CO two. So even if just burning off the methane that comes out of the landfill is a big improvement over just letting it stop. It. Okay. And finally, socially, I mean, we're just wasting food. We have hungry people in California and the U.S., and so how do we go about using this food or redirecting this waste in a way that can feed people and, and increase food security in across America? So where do you begin to think about how do you get rid of food waste? And so there are very two very, very different stories. If we look across the world where most people live, not in the U.S., not in Europe, not in Japan, most of the food waste is occurring before it gets to the consumer. It's issues with pests, it's issues with slow transit to market. How do we get that food there in time before it goes back? However, if we look in sort of a modern, sorry, you know, northern economy, U.S., Europe, you know, East Asia, we see that most of the food waste is coming later on in the supply chain at the consumer side, whether it be in the restaurants, the retailers or in households. And so those obviously present very, very different challenges. Households are very diffuse. Individual actors are many, many, many. On the processor side, so you're a slaughtering plant, a big processor, they have incentives and it may be easier to deal with that and redirect that waste, whether it be to energy or to produce it. But on the consumer side, it's really hard to figure out what's going on. So, what can be done? So there's a great report that just came out, this Greenfeed report. This goes and if you Google Refeed, R-E-F-E-D, you can find a lot of information. So it's a composite of sort of government and industry. And they made one of these classic cost of aging curves that hopefully everybody's seen. McKinsey probably did one of the early ones on um, carbon dioxide. So here we have economic value per ton. And this is diversion from actual how many megatons of um, waste you can divert. And if we look sort of up on the top, there's the blue things are prevention, the lighter greens are recovery, the darker greens are recycling. You can see a lot of gain can be made from changing behaviors. So this whether it be standardizing, date labeling. So you know we all go to the store and we all get very confused. Buy, buy, use, buy, sell, buy, best buy. Most things last much longer. I think that's sort of coming. And then the second side is this consumer education campaign. How do you get consumers to waste less? And so one side of it, which people on campus are starting to do as real research projects are going to go in and you go in, it's been done in Europe, it's been done a little bit in Canada, but you actually do household diaries, food diaries. You go into households for a week, you have to record what they're doing, and you try to understand why they're throwing stuff away. You actually dive into dumpsters or dive into their garbage bags and kind of weigh what's going on. So that's one aspect to getting at sort of food waste. In the household level, and it's, it, but remember, it's a very sticky economic problem because people shouldn't be wasting food. So the question is, why are they wasting food? Because by wasting food, you're wasting money. On the other side, is a little bit easier are the restaurants, and so that's what we wanted um, to figure out. So, given Leo's the students, and so there's lots of cheap restaurants around campus, we sort of targeted these lunch restaurants in the 10 to 15 um, dollar area. So he surveyed and interviewed moderately priced restaurants in Berkeley. It's very <coughs> preliminary data, so we set up, we got about a 22% response rate, still 30, um, about 30 restaurants, nine in-person interviews, but it's just sort of a beginning point. So there's really, as I said, it's a very data poor environment. So, um, kind of give you a little bit of a flavor of the restaurants. Most of them were individuals. We don't have a lot of chain restaurants in Berkeley, a few that had more than four. Um, average lunch cost was six to ten dollars, so very reasonably priced prices. Not the high-end places, maybe not the places where people are really in touch with what um, should be done. So what did we find? First, the sort of the composite of the survey, we found that about 38% of restaurants don't measure the amount of food waste. There's varying things. There's extreme things that Caldine did for a while, the system called Lean Pack, where you actually get scales, tablets, apps, and it allows you to like code everything in and really figure out what's going on and really target along your workflows. It works really well in the sort of the big place like Caldine, even if you're in GM brand, sort of places where you have huge amounts of food coming through. I mean, and, but there are other simpler, cheaper things. USDA on their website has a checklist. 
And but a lot of places kind of just kind of say, oh, I kind of have this much food waste. You're kind of estimating. Another 14% are putting edible leftovers into the landfills, so there's just some easy stuff which should be composting. And 86% of the chains, albeit small number, are not donating leftovers. And the main thing about donating leftovers is if you go back, this goes back to the, Clinton, the first Clinton administration, we'll be maybe saying that soon. Um, there was a Food Liability Act passed. So if you donate your food to a, a nonprofit charity, you are exempt from liability. I mean, maybe you're, you still have maybe issues if you give it to somebody right on the street. So there are really no legal barriers to donating food. Um, very few knew about the tax benefits. There's questions about whether you have your staff act more sustainably in terms of how you do things. And as I just sort of said, 75% um, don't understand the liability about food donations. And less than half are proactively um, offering dog bags to um, for customers, even though that's this was quite shocking to my German student because in, in Germany, the idea of a doggy bag is, doesn't happen at restaurants. But then again, portions are smaller and everything kind of works out. And so on the broad side, what can you do? I mean, there's obviously issues of resizing, issues of partnering. Sorry, these are a little bit small, but I can sort of email you in terms of the websites. How do you get measuring? Uh, I think Susan talked about the stockways.org. The Alameda County does have initiatives in a partnership with Impact for bigger places that are spending more than $300,000 annually on food to help them understand how to waste less food and to sort of more of these behaviors. But it's really, really an open area. Restaurants shouldn't be wasting food from a financial standpoint. Consumers shouldn't be wasting food from a financial standpoint. So it's really trying to figure out how do we move people down that path to get them to waste less food. So I'm going to wrap up there. It's about 2.40, so we have some time, I think, for an open discussion in terms of any of the issues you've heard. Can I ask you through. Yeah, sure. Do you have any, because I know the uh, Good Samaritan, like, yeah. really, like, I, I've heard that, and I work in good service yeah. areas. Yeah. And I feel like nobody knows that. Yeah. And they I don't believe it. Like, nobody believes it if I tell them that. I feel like there should be some sort of campaign. Yeah, I know, and I actually yeah. was very, I didn't understand it today. I was okay. like, I left my own language right, so I actually went back and printed out the food, the federal bill, I don't know who Bill Emerson was, Big Samaritan Food Act. Protects you from liability when you donate to a nonprofit. Protects you from civil and criminal liability should the product donated in good faith later cause harm. Yes. Standardizes donor liability exposure across all states, so probably back in 1896. Every state, some states had laws, some didn't. And sets a floor on gross negligence. But I feel like I've even been in situations where they know it, but they don't believe it. I don't know, there's like yeah. this, because it's, it'd be scary. The Nation Connection link, the website, has a tab for legal liabilities, which doesn't work. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, not, I mean, that's not our website. I should say it. No, I mean, it's. No. Yeah, from a food for service perspective, that in good faith is the main thing that we focus on. Um, so we need to be making sure that we're donating, donating food that is actually safe. And from a catering perspective, a lot of times it's not safe because it's reached that temperature danger zone. And so the trick is to keep this food food safe and then get it to the people in the right amount of time. Yeah, I think that is the key point. Is the is the as restaurants say, oh, I would like to donate, yeah. but it's now closing time in the middle of the night. And it's not how, safe. Anymore. It's not safe, or it's going to be. I, how do you? I mean, can I gonna come get it? They don't get it there while it's still safe, or get somebody to come get it while it's still safe. I mean, on the Uber side, I know there are startups in Germany, I have students that's working at, that are doing like end of, if it's a Danish startup, I want to say, that's doing like end of day app, where it like says restaurants closing and puts on the app. You know, we have specials come in. It's a you know mystery meal, but yeah. then you get that, and that's one way they're trying to reduce sort of food waste on there. Just to try to understand, um, if, you, if it goes in the trash, you still deduct the cost of it from your business. I mean, it's a business expense, yeah. so, the, so somehow they're oh, getting a larger deduction than they would from just yeah, the I mean, I know, yeah. It looks like there's something about 25% of fair market value here. That could be true, yeah. Okay. So they, yeah, that, that's, I'm sure there's something set or not. And I think there's um, some, a bill right now at, 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 yeah. at the state level to um, make it available to more businesses, some ones that haven't quite fallen under that. I don't know the specifics. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it, it's a really open space where there's both 
conversation going in all different directions. But you said that so few of the providers are actually getting the metrics yes. without having a grad student in the room doing yeah. it for them. So. Yeah, that's the real challenge. Is how, I mean, this, but I would say this is a classic science uh, research problem. You say, funding agencies, you can't go to and say, I know there's an interesting answer here. Give me money, I need to collect a year or two worth of data, I'll come back and tell you. But this is sort of the problem that exists for food waste, especially in the household level. And I think to understand what are the levers or what you, I mean, if you're going to change behaviors, mm -hmm. how do you collect enough data to understand what behaviors do? I mean, there's some possibilities that are probably not so expensive. I mean, one way is certainly Nielsen. Nielsen, there are people that have Nielsen scanners in their household, so you can pay, and they scan every food they buy because you know everybody wants to know what brand the brand companies want to know what's being bought. So you can pay them to like scan everything they waste, but there are only a thousand of them or something in the whole country or not. And it's people who do that. Yeah, but they're paid. But they're paid deals to participate. So they're already paid to like have a scanner in their house and buy and scan everything they buy. So adding on, you can say, well, you know, you get a little extra if you do this part. So I mean, but there are people. There's a, in Nashville, it's going to start, and then hopefully on in New York and in Denver, actually going into households. When you're looking at the household level at that waste, is there? Are you aware of any differentiation between the waste of highly processed and packaged foods versus fresh? I mean, I would assume more that, fresh produce I mean, that, gets tossed. That has not started yet, and I and I can put you in touch with um, Laura, who's going to do that. This is in, um, in partnership with NRDC, and I think and we were having a discussion because I have a I'm interested in sort of modeling food waste as part of this component and we connect it back to energy or connect it back to water. I mean, there's big issues in terms of what is the energy recovery you can get as well as <coughs> sort of thinking of nutrient recovery. So the sort of people of an engineering here thinking about how you recover, A, get rid of what you don't want and put the nutrients out and put it back in the field. So I mean, if you think of places like Santa Cruz, County, where you're at this sort of urban, not really rural interface, but you're growing food very close to a big urban center, the question is how do you bring wastewater back onto those fields? Or treated wastewater, get what you can out of it. Um, and I think now all developments in California, new developments have to have a third, like a third pipe of gray water. You, if you build at big scale, you have to put in a gray water system of some sort so you can get some of the water out without it. Um, and get it back to that field irrigation and other stuff. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, I'm there was a stat of 4% of the yeah. greenhouse gas. So is, yeah. Is that based on emissions? Yeah, that's emissions. So it doesn't account for the actual production of that waste of food. It's just the additional. I, the life cycle is a fun thing, and I don't. I would have to go back and trace back that statistic. It could go both ways. It could be what's coming out. Of, it could be a different landfill, but it could be total life cycle. Yeah, but but they're driving around cars. I mean, I think there's some big elephants. There are ways to accomplish it, but I was meant to. I don't worry about that. Is 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 the bigger problem at the point of disposal or at the point of purchase? I don't think we really know that completely. What What do you mean? Point of well, I mean, this goes back to you should never. The idea is never to have to. I mean, there's which is the, which is the right lever to focus on. Which is the most more, more like relevant to leverage for so. The purchase, the point of purchase, don't waste more food, don't buy food you're not going to eat. Because the others that's that's a preventable action and that's a behavior that's quite easy to change. Not maybe easy to change. But the other side is now you bought the food, you're wasting mm -hmm. it. I can find ways to, to recover nutrients and energy from it, but that may pose additional technology or other challenges. And hopefully the system all sort of settles. If, if everybody started purchasing less food, there would be a safe, there should be the broader economic signal that goes through the watershed. Yeah, I was just going to say, great. It seems like you were present the question. It doesn't, it doesn't make economic sense that people this week can get people to cost money because it's equivalent to months. I would say that. I went to the province a couple weeks ago through cost of a magnitude. I think a lot of it is just that. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, there, I mean, that I, seems like a study that would be exciting to see the dollar amounts of the things wasted and people are wasting cheap food and not expensive food. You know, no, that's that, that that's the, those are those next steps you really want to get, and, and that's the distortion in the farm bill. And the farm bill has got a lot of interesting things that make a lot of different constituents happy. So it's, it's harder to also the, the, the conference largely ignored the environmental costs of food and the health consequences of the food. Right? It was largely it, it, it's still you know, means of production are enormously consequential. Um, right. Yeah. So I mean, I think one. Problem with some of the views. The conference is amazing and great, and a lot of great people. But a lot of like the economic analysis used the price of what the environmental impact on the carbon market. And obviously, the price of the environmental impact is like ten x whatever x whatever the what actual cost of that carbon credit is. So uh, I'm I'm out of my take here, but yeah. it seems like. As long as we insist on having, you know, bananas in Berkeley in yeah. February, we're going to have food waste, right? It, it's sort of like if you want to have a range of choices and you want to have them unseasonally and you want to have food that doesn't come from here. Yeah, you know, we're we're, we're pausing the problem. Yeah, and that was when my wife Leo, an economist, that's a postdoc an economist, always says, "What's the I optimal amount of food waste?" I mean, you have to set what, but you're kind of getting in, a, in our modern system. There's going to be some level, but I would venture that we're not at we're not at that efficiency frontier yet. So we're way off of it. We need to bring ourselves I mean, bring ourselves off or back. Yeah. yeah. Imagine how you're going. And when your bananas turn black, what do you do? Yeah. yeah. Put them in the freezer. Make banana bread. Yeah. But but it's a problem also in terms of that question because yeah. it's the conscious then it's the rotary genes yeah. and that's the all that. They and they don't want you buying less. <laughs> they want you buying more. So, so you have all these things coming here to buy and don't need when you have to go to the source. But it's, it's easier to change. It's more popular than change uh, consumer building. Well, it can come to uh, food environment too. Like if you have a grocery store right next to you, you're more likely to go there more often and buy what you need than if you like have to go to a grocery store and buy a so bunch. Yeah. Yeah. It's this time. Can I ask a question for you, Kristen? Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> I'm curious about the logical conclusion of of the year nomenclature uh, regarding the word wild and feral food. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that you want people to be eating more of these types of foods. Yeah. Does that necessarily mean that it would be a good thing if they started large scale agriculture or of well, these foods and in which case they belong no, longer. Yeah, so what wild. we're what what we're trying to do with the farms is on farms and weeds grow, right? And sometimes they grow um, like if there's a bunch that grow in between the rows and we've gone to farms and there's a lot of food there that's being picked and thrown out because they don't think anybody wants it. Um, but that those plants are were oftentimes brought over as food. It's just we started to, you know, cultivate different different foods. Sometimes they're a little bit more bitter or like what you know, crazier. Um, so trying to get them to people to recognize those as food and ask for them, and the farms to harvest those. But yeah, you're right. Like if you buy a dandelion from the grocery store, it's not wild. It's just grown dandelion. And so is the goal to kind of minimize waste? In the yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, so or to increase production? No, of, oh, minimize yeah. waste. Yeah, no. I would say yeah. I think there's two sides. There's you go in the urban environment, pick food. Yeah, and, and then there's and that, on the farm. And on the farm is I didn't even get into it. Nobody knows. What Going on on farms in terms of waste, whether it be weeds or no <laughs> yeah. weed or food that could be. In, in our culture, these foods are wasted wherever they, they volunteer, and they're wasted wherever they volunteer. They're wasted whether it's the sidewalk or between yeah. the rows of the farm, the barn, and the farm. And the um, ones that we're talk, we talk about the most are the like, really invasive ones that we're trying. That the farmers are like hate. <laughs> they're like, "What? You want this? You want to eat this? Break? Like, take it? You know?" Of mm. yeah. there's something like um, so Miguel Altieri and this is uh, did a survey of, of uh, the, the most common plant pests according to urban gardeners and farmers in the Bay Area. And of the 19 they identified, 11 are edible, including 1 through 6. Mm -hmm. I have a very technical question. Yeah. How is serving size determined? Because I'm wondering if there was, there was yeah, one yeah, that had a problem. Yeah, is yeah. it by dry weight or is it? It was not, they, well, we went, we used the, the lab, a lab locally based, and spinach is a very, like the one cup of spinach yeah, is like yeah. a standard that they use, that they use when they're, 
Okay. We tried to say that we, okay. we, we, we started to do it, yeah, we tried it a million different ways, and that's the result that we came up with, but no matter how you look at it, it's still more nutritious. Can you speak more to the, you know, the, the cachet of these wild foods and... Yeah, really, it seems like from an economic standpoint, there could be like a real yeah. benefit, socioeconomically speaking, to what? being able to go in your backyard and yeah. feel confident. I think when you say wild, like what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of wild foods? Anybody? Yeah, berries. Berries, mushrooms. mushrooms, right? Berries and mushrooms are usually the first things. I think that, especially mushrooms, have this very like prestigious, they're, very, they're more rare, special, like so they're expensive. So I think that people think wild, they think of these you know, very like precious things, but we're trying to get people to not only eat those, but these invasive plants that are in your backyard. Yeah. But then it comes with a stigma. Like even like my parents live in Humboldt and have this like amazing garden, but I try to get them to eat these things and they're like, what? Um, so, you know, it's like a, it's, it's overcoming that. I mean, for you to get that, you know, there are enormous cultural differences. Um, these plants have been part of traditional human diet for tens of thousands of years. They've fallen out of fashion because they're not generally compatible with our current means of production. They're not compatible with row cropping, typically. They don't transport that well. And we've selectively bred things to be more palatable, meaning sweeter um, and less intense in flavor. Yeah. And a lot of these things have intense flavors. Our culture's moving back towards that in some ways with arugula and kale and and on yeah. and you know, things like that that are, that are a little bit more intense, but in general, that's not what the typical American palate is. So there's a little bit on, the, and also there's on your mouth feels, textures, and all of these other things. But part of that's like exciting for chefs, I think. Um, and you can see that from a nutrition standpoint, too, is not only is our food becoming blander and sweeter, is our becoming most nutritious. Most nutritious because it's blander and sweeter. Um, so I think, I maybe mean, think about kale. But How kale has really like become an actual food when before it was just a garnish next to the, like the orange slice. <laughs> so, so, so at the same time, there, there are many parts of the world where these are still part of daily diet, right? You go out and forage and stuff. And the difference between the berries and the mushrooms and this stuff is berries and mushrooms have a relatively short season, if a season at all, you know, depending on where you live. The greens have a season just about everywhere on the planet, including the desert. I mean, it's just it's remarkable. You can feed yourself almost anywhere, almost any day, if you start looking at greens. Mm -hmm. Do you need like an edible schoolyard project? Well, we I have, have photos that show more food volunteering outside the boxes at the edible schoolyard than being deliberately grown in the boxes. There's more food available. Well, and those are your best ambassadors. The yeah. People, yeah. You got the kids. Well, that, was <laughs> that happened when Sam and I, before the, the Browns wild food thing, because um, we're still working with the farm, things really new, and so they forgot to deliver a few things. So we were like, oh, we have this event, we have to get, so we went to the Clark Kerr garden, and we didn't pick anything in the boxes, we just like found stuff, and there was a ton of stuff, and it's, we're, uh, the health inspector approved us to use anything in that garden, so it was good. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I think it's just a matter of what type of wild plant you're talking about, and getting people to think of them as food, which is why we're going the restaurant route is one of our ways to infiltrate. Any other questions? What? Oh, it's about that time. Yes. Oh, it's about that time. It's about that time. If the other group are on. Thank you.